Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to our virtual program today, Wonderful World of Woodpeckers. Um, and thank you for everyone for letting us know in the chat where you're tuning in from, if you've seen a woodpecker before, and for helping us to complete that poll. Uh, so we're going to get started with our program. Um, and the way that our program today is going to work is I'm going to start off by reading a children's book. The, the name of this book is um, Woodpecker Wham. You can kind of see the picture in the slideshow there by April Pulley Sayre, illustrated by Steve Jenkins. And so it's a really fun children's book that has a lot of really great examples of um, species that we may see here. But then there are also a couple that are only found on the East Coast. And the book kind of talks about some of the, their adaptations and behaviors. Um, and then I'll elaborate more on those uh, later in our program and talk about the, the local species that we have here in Santa Clara County Parks. Um, but to start us off, we'll read this fun, whimsical, rhyming children's book and um, learn a little bit um, to start our program off. So um, I do apologize. I had a document reader so that I could read this um, with an overhead view so that you could see the pictures a little bit better. But um, it was not syncing up, so I'm going to have to read it like this. And I'll do my best to show you the, the photographs um, and the illustrations. So the name of the book is Woodpecker Wham by April Police Sayre illustrated by Steve Jenkins. And on our cover here, we have what looks like a um, downy woodpecker, which is a species that we can find in Santa Clara County Parks. We have a lot of adults in the audience, so don't worry. Um, we're gonna talk science in a little bit, but this book is a really fun kind of whimsical way to be introduced to woodpeckers. And we all need a little bit of, um, of happiness and joy right now with everything that's going on in the world, so. Here we go, our book. Swoop and land, hitch and hop, shred a tree stump, chop, chip, chop. So we have our, looks like a pileated woodpecker up on a tree. We'll talk about those woodpeckers in a little bit. Flying around, getting to that tree stump so that they can get inside. Instant message, tap one, two. Bonk, bonk, bonk. Now back to you. So here we have a woodpecker on a tree, and it says instant message, which is an interesting way to put it. And that's referring to woodpeckers and how they communicate. They do something called drumming. So that's that instant message where they're letting that other woodpecker know what they're doing, uh, maybe uh, communicating territory, or maybe they're trying to attract a mate. Early insects click and crawl, flick and flake to find them all. So here we have two woodpeckers. It looks like a downy woodpecker over here, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and maybe a hairy woodpecker over here looking for insects. And if you look closely next to that one, you can kind of see a grub underneath that leaf. So maybe it just flecked some bark off and it's gonna go get to that, that grub. Spring sap rises, who will drill? Sap sucker, sap sucker, sticky bill. So here you can see this is a different type of woodpecker. It's called a sap sucker. And what they do is they create these little wells in a tree trunk um, and the sap oozes out. And so they're actually able to eat that sap. And then that sap actually attracts insects as well. So that sap sucker can eat the sap and the insects that are attracted to it. So we'll learn more about this a little bit later. That's our sap sucker. Fan those feathers, shower clean. Sunbathe dry, then oil and preen. So here we have some flickers. And so we have flickers here on the West Coast. Ours look a little different. We'll talk about that later. Um, I think these are the ones on the East Coast, just because they have yellow under their wings. Ours tend to have more of a reddish color there. Um, and so you can see them very beautiful birds and not typical, I think they look a little bit different than most of the woodpeckers that we think of. They're not black and white uh, and red. Raise that crest, bob and bow, flash those wings, it's time to wow. Start a home, build to bark, 
dig it, dig it, deep and dark. So here we have our woodpecker over here showing off, maybe trying to attract that mate. And then here we have our woodpecker that's trying to excavate their home. So they are cavity nesters, and so they will create holes in trees so that they can um, put their eggs inside and raise their chicks. Wedge it, sledge it, wham by wham, clear those chips, slam, slam, slam. Hawks are hunting, stop, drop, hide, quiet on the other side. So we have our hawk up here, and woodpeckers need to watch out because they do have predators. So here we have our flicker hiding underneath a branch so that that hawk can't get to him. Cherries, berries, pluck and feed, leave a dropping full of seed. So woodpeckers, they don't just eat insects or sap. We learned about sap, right? They can also eat fruit. And so, um, which makes them seed dispersers because when they poop out the seeds that are in that fruit, um, it means that potentially, you know, whatever that plant is gonna grow into, um, could have, you know, it's gonna be spread by that bird. So they eat lots of fruit. We have our flicker. So there we have another woodpecker. Tap, tap, tap. Where? Look and see. Crick, crick, crack. Six chicks break free. Hungry mouths and begging calls. Hunt, hop, pick. Quick, feed them all. So we have our chicks that have just hatched inside that tree cabin. And then that parent bird has to make sure that they get enough food for those chicks that are developing. So, not much time for rest. They gotta make sure that they have lots of food for their, their newly hatched chicks. Fledglings fly, oops, fledglings flop. Chase and feed, when will it stop? So we have our parent bird feeding our fledgling right there. We have our fledgling trying to learn to fly, but looking a little bit awkward, right? So they're not fully independent right away. They still rely on their parents to help them get enough food and learn how to, to forage and to, to find food um, so that they can survive on their own. But it takes a little bit of time. Fluffy fledglings now are grown. Wicca, wicca, on their own. So we can see a bunch of fledglings all around. Eventually they're going to spread out, maybe go to a different, you know, territory and start their own families. Fall is falling, acorns plunk, pry seeds, pull seeds, fill a trunk. So now we're talking about a different type of woodpecker that likes to collect acorns. And so we don't have this species here. We have a different species called an acorn woodpecker. And um, they like to hammer those, those acorns into the tree to help store them. But there are other woodpeckers that like acorns as well. We see that here. Leave that tree hole, start one new. Who will move in after you? So when woodpeckers create those nest holes and then they leave them, they create new ones maybe the next year, someone else can move into that hole. Other species of birds, squirrels, all sorts of animals. So woodpeckers are really, really important. They help lots of different species to thrive. Build to bark, build, slam, 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 chip and chop, Woodpecker wham. So really just going to town, making that big hole. And that's actually the end of our story, but this book is really neat because it has a lot of information about woodpeckers. 
Um, I'm not going to read this through right now. It's more of a reference um, section, but um, we're going to talk about some of our local woodpeckers right now. So I'll, I'll share my screen again, um, but this book is called Woodpecker Wham. So it's a fun little rhyming children's book. So hope you enjoyed that book. And now we're going to learn about our local woodpecker species. So I'm going to share my screen again. You should be seeing it. If you can see my screen, if you want to raise your hand, just so I know that everyone that's tuning in um, is able to see what's going on. Lots of hand raise. Awesome. You can lower your hands if you want. You want to test that feature out, lowering your hands. That'd be great. Cool. So woodpeckers have lots of really neat adaptations. So I like to think of an adaptation as kind of like being an animal's superpower. So it's something, an adaptation is something that helps an animal to survive in their environment. So an adaptation can be something physical, something on their body that allows them to do something really special, or it could be behavioral. Maybe they've um, learned to do something that helps them to survive. And so I'm going to talk about a lot of different um, uh, adaptations that woodpeckers have. And then I'm going to talk about why these adaptations help make them uh, really uh, valuable um, to other animals and to their, their habitat as a whole. So um, quick raise of hands. How many uh, Marvel fans do we have here? Seeing a bunch of hands go up. Awesome, very cool. So, uh, you know, woodpeckers don't necessarily have these type of uh, superpowers, but they have some really cool ones, which we're gonna talk about now. So the first one that I wanna talk about is that sharp beak. So woodpeckers, um, they like to get into, um, into wood, into trees. And so they're after insects most of the time when they do this, uh, but sometimes sap, sometimes they're you know, trying to store acorns, but they need to be able to um, excavate that tree. And what allows them to do this is um, having a really sharp um, beak. And so it's almost like a chisel and that it's able to slide into that wood really easily. Um, and then you, you think if they're pecking all day, how does that tool not get dull? How does it not wear down to, to nothing? Um, and they have something that helps them with this as well. And um, their beak is actually made up of a bunch of different layers of material. And so that outer layer that kind of surrounds their beak um, is made up of keratin, which is similar to what your fingernails are made out of. And it regenerates really fast. And so um, it allows that woodpecker's beak to stay nice and sharp so it doesn't wear down. And it protects the bone that's underneath um, that in their bill. And then also inside their beak, um, the bottom layer of their beak is actually um, slightly longer. The bone section on the inside is slightly longer. And so this is really important because it allows them to, when they're pecking into that tree, the force kind of travels down into their body away from their head. So um, it allows them to keep their head nice and safe. But they have other things that help them to do this as well. So I'm going to talk about those now. So woodpeckers have what I like to think of as super strength just in their head, right? They don't have helmets um, on. You know, this is, I have a a hockey helmet on this woodpecker, but they don't have that in real life. So they, they have adaptations inside. And so one of those is that they have um, a kind of a spongy layer of bone inside their skull that acts as kind of a shock absorber. So it helps to protect their brain. And then in addition to this, their brain is actually really tightly packed inside their skull. So like our brains, there's a layer of fluid and there can be a lot of motion. If we were to get into a crash or something, our brain would kind of move around on the inside a lot. Whereas woodpeckers are so tightly packed that there isn't gonna be a lot of motion, a lot of sloshing of their brain back and forth when they peck. So this helps to protect the brain with that spongy layer of bone. Um, they also have really strong neck muscles, and so this helps them to brace and to peck really fast and powerfully. Um, they can peck up to 20 times per second, which is about, um, I think it's something like 25 miles per hour is the impact that they're hitting these trees, which is insane to think about your head smashing into something at 25 miles per hour, but they survive this um, and they thrive. 
Also, when you think about smashing your head into something that fast, um, what about your eyes? How do their eyes not pop out of their head? And they have something for this too. They actually have an extra eyelid. Um, it's kind of, it's the same thing that um, your cat, you might have seen before, a clear kind of transparent eyelid that goes over the top. And so when they go to peck into a tree, um, the woodpecker has this extra eyelid that kind of covers it up and it prevents their eyes from popping their head out of their head, almost acting like kind of like a seat belt. Um, and it also prevents some of that sawdust from getting into their eyes which is also what, what they have um, to help with is nasal bristles. So on their um, bill, they have this, um, you can't really see it as much here, but they have um, little nose hairs almost like on their beak that allows them to prevent um, all the, the dust and the wood chips from being inhaled. So lots of different adaptations on their head that protect them um, from getting headaches and concussions and things like that. So super strength, but in their head. A long sticky tongue. So inside that beak, inside that skull, they have a really neat adaptation and that is a very long sticky tongue. Um, it is so long that it is up to, can be up to a third of their body length. So to put that into perspective, if I was a woodpecker and I had a tongue that was a third of my body length, I have, um, some fruit by the foot right here, some fruit tape to demonstrate this. So I'm about five feet, six inches. So almost two feet is what my, my tongue would be like if I was a woodpecker. And I can try and stop, stop sharing my screen really quickly to uh, show that to you so you can see a little bit better. So if I was a woodpecker, my tongue would be about this long. And so you might be thinking, how, where do they put this thing? Like that is way longer than me. I have nowhere to store this. Um, and so woodpeckers actually have something that helps them with this as well. The tongue actually is stored around their skull. So it splits into two as it enters. So it splits into two and then it wraps around the top and stops kind of near their beak. So I can't really do this with this sticky piece, but it would go inside and then around the top of my head. Um, and then when it's ready to come out, it kind of, there's a special bone in there that allows it to, to pop out. So I'll share my screen again so you can see that um, slide that shows the anatomy a little bit better. Um, so it's stored around their head and because it splits into two like that, um, having a tongue that wraps around your head actually helps to provide some additional uh, shock absorption. So protecting their brain once again. Um, so in addition to having a long sticky tongue, uh, or I haven't mentioned the sticky part yet, but they do have really sticky saliva that can help them to grab onto that prey. So they dug their hole into the tree, they've stuck their, hung, their tongue in there, and it's almost like a snake that's trying to uh, get that clog in a drain or something. And once it gets to that prey, some woodpecker tongues have barbs that are facing backwards, almost like a fishing hook, that are able to grab onto ants or grubs or things like that. And then other woodpeckers have um, almost like brush-like tongues. So um, I'm not gonna make my screen big for this one, but if you think of like a pipe cleaner, um, how it's kind of fuzzy and has lots of hairs, that's actually what a sap sucker's tongue is like and it's able to help lap up some of that um, tree sap. So long sticky tongue, really long, um, that wraps around their skull, provides shock protection, uh, has barbs or bristles depending on what they eat, and it's very sticky saliva that allows them to grab that prey really um, easily. So really interesting superpower. And then last but not least, they can walk up walls, or in this case, they can walk up trees, right? So you see woodpeckers traveling along a tree trunk, uh, going up and foraging. And so they have a couple of things that allow them to uh, walk up trees. Um, the main one is that they have uh, what are called zygodactyl feet. So if you want to say that aloud at home, zygodactyl. It's kind of like pterodactyl but the beginning part is zygodactyl. 
And so what it means is their foot shape is two toes forward and two toes back, kind of like this. So if you were to see their foot, it almost looks like um, an X shape. I'm not gonna make my screen um, bigger for this, so hopefully you can see this good enough. Um, so they have two toes forward, one toe back, and what that allows them to do is to grab on um, to that tree trunk really well. Um, most birds, uh, or a lot of birds, have three toes forward and one toe back. But uh, woodpeckers have two forward and two back. Uh, there's some other birds that have this zygodactyl foot. Uh, the one that comes to mind is uh, owls have it. It allows them to grab onto prey. Um, and I think parrots do as well, which helps them to like eat fruit and things like that and pull it up to their mouth. But for woodpeckers, it allows them to grab onto that tree trunk uh, really tightly. But then they also have another thing, uh, which is really stiff tail feathers. So if you take a look at this picture right here, you can kind of see how it's using that tail as a prop, as like a tripod. So it helps to brace them as they grab on with their feet and peck their head. So it's an additional uh, means of support by having those stiff tail feathers that give them balance. Um, so when I start to talk about different species of woodpeckers, I want you to look at the photos to, to look for some of these adaptations, especially that tail, because you're gonna see it against that tree every single time. All right, so we've gone over a bunch of superpowers, and now I'm curious if you were able to choose a superpower, which one would you choose? So I'm going to launch a different poll, and um, you are allowed to select multiple options in case you have a couple siblings tuning in with you and you pick different things. You can only pick one, though, so I want to know which one uh, everyone is interested in choosing. Super strength sounds pretty awesome, but it's only your head. So you can only use your head to, to maybe smash through walls and things like that. So I'll give about maybe a minute, a minute and 30 seconds for everyone to vote. Lots of people voting super quick. Looks like oh, there's a clear winner though. I'll share the results in a second. Um, yeah, I'm not sure which one I would choose. It's, it's tough, I don't know. All right, I'll give about 20 more seconds. We're 75% of um, participants have voted. What do you guys think it's gonna be? All right, I'm gonna reveal those answers in three, two, one. All right. So the winner of that was walking up walls. I guess you guys wanna be able to scale buildings. Um, or I don't know what else you would use that for, but it's a pretty cool one. Walking up walls, nice. And then super strength of your head was second place, followed by long sticky tongue. Cool, nice, awesome. So, we've talked about superpowers, but what makes someone or something a superhero? So I'm curious if you wanna type in the chat really quick what you think being a superhero actually means. I'm curious to see what your definition is, and then I'll give you my definition, and I'll talk about why woodpeckers are superheroes. Think about that definition really quick. We have about 10 more seconds. I don't see many coming in on the chat. That's okay. So for me, when I think of superheroes, um, Maybe the first thing that I think of is superpowers, right? But if you have superpowers, that doesn't necessarily make you a superhero. You could have superpowers and use them for bad things. You'd be a supervillain. Superheroes have extraordinary abilities or powers, and they use them for good. They use them to help others. And so, yeah, I see that in a lot of, in, in some of the definitions here. Awesome. So woodpeckers are superheroes because they have all these really cool adaptations, these abilities that allow them to do really great things for their community, for their habitat. So what are those things that they do? Uh, one of the main things that they do is they are primary cavity nesters. So that means that they create their own uh, nesting holes and roosting holes. And so um, they create lots of them. When they're trying to decide where to nest, they might create five, six different holes, different roosting holes, and then they choose one and they leave the other ones. And so what that does is it creates lots of housing for different animals. 
for different songbirds, uh, for ducks, owls, squirrels, bats, lots of animals rely on woodpeckers to create their homes for them because these other animals can't create these holes in trees. So woodpeckers help them by creating a house, essentially. Leftover lunch. So we talked about um, how woodpeckers or sap suckers um, can, you know, create these little sap wells and then it attracts insects sometimes. And so then other uh, animals can see these sap wells and they might take some of that woodpecker's, you know, hard-earned meal or maybe the woodpecker's flown away, gone somewhere else. So there's insects and sap. That sap can also attract birds like hummingbirds might um, be attracted to that sap. And then um, all the, the woodpeckers who are uh, ex excavating into um, trees, they're exposing that tree to, um, to the grubs that are, might be in it to other animals. So they create all these little micro habitats where um, different animals are able to all of a sudden have access to some of the bugs that might be living in that tree. Woodpeckers are really important for insect population control. So woodpeckers like to go after uh, wood boring insects, ants, and so without woodpeckers, we might have uh, too many insects. There might be an overabundance and that might cause problems in our forests or in our own homes maybe if we have an insect infect infestation. Um, and then also nutrient cycling and forest health. So when woodpeckers uh, create holes in trees, sometimes that tree uh, might be exposed to, you know, a fungal infection or something, and that tree starts to break down, which is a natural part of that forest um, cycle. And so it allows those nutrients to be brought back into the earth and then for new trees to grow later. So woodpeckers help to speed up that um, decomposition, that regeneration process by creating um, holes in trees and things like that. So I thought about putting a cape on this uh, woodpecker, but I figured Capes get uh, caught on a lot of stuff, and so uh, instead of having a cape, you know, they have wings, so they can fly without their cape. So this woodpecker is showing off his wings. Um, it's better than a cape, I think. So woodpeckers that we have uh, here in Santa Clara County, I'm going to go over some of those now, some common ones that you might come across. Um, one really popular one that is probably one of the most abundant ones in Santa Clara County parks is the acorn woodpecker. And um, acorn woodpeckers rely on oak woodlands. That is where they like to live um, because they're one of their primary uh, diet staples is are acorns. And so um, acorn woodpeckers are master hoarders. So they like to store acorns like crazy so that they have enough when times are lean, when they don't maybe have access to enough food. So they'll create these giant things called granaries, um, which are in trees, they can be in telephone poles, maybe they're in the side of your house sometimes. Um, and so they're trying to store acorns for when they need them. And uh, acorn woodpeckers live in uh, these complex social groups. So you have males and females uh, mating with each other in one group. The females all lay their eggs in one nest. You have the siblings that actually help to rear the chicks. And so they have this big uh, community that is helping to gather acorns and store them, keep their territory safe, and then raise their offspring. So they're very loud birds. They're very, um, uh, they're interesting to watch. And so uh, really anywhere that there are oak woodlands, you're gonna come across them. And uh, I listed a couple parks, Ed Levin, Coyote Lake, Almond and Quicksilver, Calero, but really all of Santa Clara County Parks is pretty much oak woodlands and you can find these birds. Um, so I have a sound for you to listen to. They are, they make some funny noises. It's kind of like a like waka waka waka, um, but I'll play it for you. I think it sometimes sounds almost like a, um, a squeaky toy um, that you might be squeezing on for your dog or something. So. This is what an acorn woodpecker sounds like. And I'll play that one more time. And 
And I do have an acorn woodpecker here that I'm going to show you. So this is a specimen that we like to keep at one of our visitor centers, which is closed right now due to COVID. Um, hopefully you'll be able to, to visit eventually. And what I want to say about specimens, just to, to make things clear, um, you know, we have as Santa Clara County Parks have these specimens for education purposes, but um, collecting birds on your own is not something that is allowed, it's against the law. And so collecting specimens for education or for scientific research, um, it's very heavily regulated. There's strict permitting and things like that, ethical guidelines. So um, it's never okay to collect a bird uh, for yourself, but I wanted to be able to show this one to you all. And um, because having specimens can be really valuable for things like color and size, things that you can't necessarily get from a picture. So this is an acorn, what an acorn woodpecker kind of looks like. And to give you a sense of scale, um, I have an iPhone here. This is an iPhone XR. And you can kind of see um, the body is about the length of a, an iPhone XR, but it extends beyond um, a little bit. So that's about how big these are. Um, bigger than a sparrow, but smaller than a robin for anyone that's familiar with those birds. So this is an acorn woodpecker. You'll notice that bright red cap um, that beak that's really good at chiseling in and storing those acorns. So this is our acorn woodpecker. All right, and then I will share my screen again. So northern flickers. So this is another species that you might come across in Santa Clara County Parks. And they're unique uh, in the woodpecker family um, because of their behavior when it comes to foraging they really like to actually forage on the ground, which isn't something we tend to think of with woodpeckers. We think that they're in trees, but flickers actually really like to forage on the ground, specifically for ants. And so um, if you're ever out in a, a county park that has some trees, but is also open, you might see um, some northern flickers on the ground um, looking for ants or other insects. And, um, like Calero, spe specifically the San Vicente um, entrance has a lot of uh, northern flickers if you're interested in, in seeing one in real life. Um, they are year-round resident. In other parts of the, the country, they're one of the woodpeckers that is very migratory, but here they're around um, throughout the year. Um, and the, there is a difference between the East Coast ones and the West Coast ones, and the main difference is in their coloration. So the ones that we have here on the West Coast have a red mustache and red kind of underneath their tail feathers and wings, where on the East Coast they have what's called the yellow shafted northern flicker that has um, a black mustache, I believe, and more yellow uh, tail feathers and yellow underneath the wings. And so I do have a specimen that I want to show you about northern flicker. And I will stop sharing my screen really quick. So this is a northern flicker, and so you can see uh, really clearly that kind of bright orange, almost reddish underneath their tail. But they have also um, this really unique bib that's um, underneath right here that is kind of different than some other woodpeckers. This one doesn't have that mustache that's very clear, um, and I can't open the wings, but if I could, you'd see that they're kind of red underneath. So then in terms of size, um, this is bigger than our acorn woodpecker. I'll kind of compare them like this. So you can see a little bit, the flicker is definitely bigger. Um, and then comparing it to the phone really quick, in case that's a little confusing, you can see that it's definitely bigger than that, that phone. So this is that northern flicker and look, really looking for that right underneath with the tail. Um, is something that's going to make it pop and then also just these polka dots and that bib is um, something that makes this one stick out from other woodpeckers. All right. Um, and then I'm going to play their, their sound for you really quick. Um, to me it sounds almost like a, a rolling rattle um, and it's similar in some ways to pileated woodpeckers um, which I'll play later. So here's our next And I'll play that one more time. Okay. 
And so um, of the woodpeckers that I'm going to talk about today, flickers actually have one of the longer tongues um, because they're on the ground. They're, they're not able to kind of make the shortcut by sticking their beak into a tree to help make up some of the distance. So they have slightly longer tongues than like pileated woodpeckers. Red-breasted sapsuckers. So um, this is our species of sapsucker that you're likely to see. There's a couple other ones that are, are more rare, but this is one that you can frequently see, especially in the winter. You can also see it in the, the late fall and the spring as well, but not really in the summer. It, it migrates away. Um, but um, you can see it at Joseph D. Grant, Almond and Quicksilver, um, or just like in any place that has like orchards or things like that, you can run into sapsuckers. And um, kind of like what I mentioned in the, in the book and a couple of different times today, sapsuckers like to go after tree sap. And so they'll dig, um, excavate into trees, these little holes. And you know it's a sapsucker if the holes are in this pattern where they're in a very straight line. And then there's another kind of straight line above it. And so they'll create these wells one after another, and then they'll kind of wait for the sap to come out, and then they'll come back to it later when the sap's out and maybe it's attracted insects and things like that. So a really unique feeding behavior among woodpeckers going after that tree sap. Um, mixed in coniferous forests, so they like a little bit more tree cover, less open habitat. Um, and then their sound is kind of like, almost like a mew to me. Mew but um, it's hard to describe, so I'll, I'll play that for you now. And so I believe that this call is more of an alarm call, so you might not necessarily hear this. It might be something similar, but more spaced out. Um, I'll play it one more time. All right, so backyard visitors. So these are woodpeckers that you might see, especially if you have a suet feeder in your backyard. So um, these woodpeckers um, are frequent visitors to those types of feeders. They, they really like that animal fat, um, which is usually in a suet feeder. And so you have um, these three woodpeckers that have very similar color schemes, right? That's kind of common with a lot of woodpeckers is black, white, and red, right? But especially in these three. And so um, the reason why they have these colors is it's what's called disruptive coloring. So it provides a type of camouflage. It breaks them up by having all these different patterns so that it's not just one solid color on a tree that's really easy for a predator to see. So uh, whoever designed these woodpecker costumes, they went for the same color scheme um, for their, their superhero costume, right? Um, and so trying to tell them apart can be challenging, but I'm gonna give you a couple of tips right now. So when it comes to the downy and hairy woodpecker, these can be really tricky, but the main thing to look for is their size, specifically the size uh, difference between their bill and their head. So I like to remember it like the downy woodpecker is dinky or dinky, if you prefer that word, and the hairy woodpecker is hefty. So downy woodpeckers are about the size of a, like a small sparrow, and then hairy woodpeckers are bigger than, than that. But that bill on a downy woodpecker, it's barely, you know, like half of their head. Whereas a hairy woodpecker, that length of that bill is almost the entire length of their head. So that's how you can remember the difference between downy and hairy. Downy has a dinky bill and hairy has a hefty bill. Um, and then telling the, the difference between a downy woodpecker and a nettles woodpecker is all about the back. So on a downy woodpecker, they have this white stripe that's kind of solid down their back, whereas a nettles woodpecker has more of a ladder pattern with stripes. Um, so that's the main way that I like to tell them apart. Um, females will not have the red patch. The males are the ones that have that. Um, but you know, if you're getting a quick look, sometimes it can be really tricky to tell them apart. Um, and then the thing that's special about Nettles woodpeckers is that they are what I call our hometown heroes. So they are only found in California. 
Um, so if you have friends that are visiting from out of town and they're birders, they might be really interested in trying to find a Nettles woodpecker because it's something that they can only see here. So I'll play those, these sounds really quick. Um, they all kind of sound similar. Um, they're kind of like a whinnying call. And the nettle woodpecker um, is more of a, like a pit, pit. Bird sound can be uh, tricky to, to learn. It takes practice. There are definitely different tips out there to, to decipher bird language. I won't have time to get into that today, but I encourage you to, um, to check out some of those bird language workshops that are out there. Pileated woodpeckers. So these ones are one of my favorites. They are master excavators. They can create giant holes in trees. Um, so if you're ever hiking and you see what looks like a chainsaw has just gone through a tree, chances are um, it was a pileated woodpecker. And um, it's also it tends to be like square or rectangular. That's another way that you can tell their holes apart. And um, they have lots of nose hairs, those uh, nasal bristles that help them to prevent all that sawdust from being inhaled. You can only really find these guys in mature forests, so Sanborn or Mount Madonna. And um, all of these pictures of these uh, pileated woodpeckers are actually ones that were at Sanborn this year. These are some fledglings um, that I'm gonna show you some video, video of in a second. Um, there are our local, our local superheroes, so very special uh, woodpeckers. They especially love ants and they love to forage for those ants on uh, downed logs in uh, forests. They're our largest woodpecker too. Um, there, potentially there could be another woodpecker, but uh, the ivory-billed woodpecker I believe, but I'm pretty sure that one is extinct, so this is our largest woodpecker. So here's the video of the chicks foraging. And uh, what I want you to look for is the adaptations on that male as it's, um, it eventually comes in to feed those chicks. You can really see on this the, the tail on that male and how it is helping to support him. Those feet as they're grabbing onto the side of that um, cavity so that he can be sturdy enough to feed his very hungry pit. They're making a lot of noise. And so we know that this is a male because um, it has a red mustache. And so male uh, pileated have a red mustache and females have just a black. Um, black feathers where that is. And so now he's going into the hole and what he's doing is actually, it's kind of like the equivalent of changing a diaper on a baby. He's actually going to clean out the poop that uh, these chicks have left behind. So it's hard to see, but when he emerges from this hole, he'll have something in his mouth. There he goes. So he's cleaning out poop. <laughs> Lots of parental duties when you have new chicks. So here's the male again. And what I want you to pay attention to is he's probably looking for predators. Um, and I'll point out where to look. So keep an eye on this, this section right here. Um, there'll be a, a dark-eyed junco that pops up. And while this isn't a predator to this bird, um, the way that he responds to it makes me think that maybe he heard something, something else or maybe he was responding to this bird. So there's the, it just came up. And so what this pileated woodpecker just did was what's called drumming. So it's a different way to communicate other than making calls or song. Um, woodpeckers will drum on trees and that's to communicate territory or to attract a mate. It's almost like Morse code um, for birds, for woodpeckers. 
All right, so I'm curious to, to hear what superhero you would pick um, of the birds that we've learned about today. So if you'd like to vote, um, we'll see if we have our, a winner. Lots of results coming in quick. It's neck and neck actually between two. Um, I'll reveal the results in just a, a couple seconds. We're at about 75% um, have voted. Leave it up for about 20 more seconds. Oh man, I don't know if we're gonna have a winner. Make sure you vote. Wow, that is, I did not expect that. All right, we have about 10 more people that can vote that can be the tiebreaker. Oh man, coming from behind. Just wait till you see that. I wish I could show the, the live polling to everyone, but I'll just be able to share the results. All right, I'm gonna give like three more seconds. All right, well, coming from behind. Oh wait, no, at the very end, we, we had a tie. The acorn woodpecker was actually um, here's, I'm sharing the results now. The acorn woodpecker was actually uh, winning. And then at the very last second, as I stopped the poll, someone voted for pileated woodpecker. And we have a tie. Wow. Um, that's pretty fun. Um, I'm curious to hear why people voted for one thing over another. So if you want to enter in the, into the chat why you chose one over the other and make a case for them, I'd be curious to, to read that. So, uh, very cool, acorn woodpecker, pileated woodpecker. That's awesome. All right, so we have actually uh, made it close to the end. I did wanna go over really quickly uh, the craft that um, I, I sent instructions out for before. I'm not gonna have as much time to go over how to make it, but I hope that the instructions were clear enough. Um, I'll show you what it does though, um, and it's really neat. So if you see the directions that I sent out, um, it's a simple craft, and when it's done, you have something that pecks along the side. Um, I can get it to work great. It was doing it better before. So we have our woodpecker pecking along that string. Um, probably hard to see in my, with my shared screen, but you can create your own woodpecker if you want to draw your own and follow the directions and create it. Um, and you want to send those in to us, um, there is an, uh, an email address to send your completed woodpeckers to um, in, the, in the directions. So uh, I'm curious to see what you come up with. It's a really fun little, little gizmo craft, so I hope you like it and think about all the different adaptations of that woodpecker, that tail, that beak, those feet as it's uh, pecking along that trunk. Um, so we are at the end, but really quickly, I just wanted to say thank you for all the photos, especially to uh, Victor and Roberto Martinez. Roberto is the, the photographer that got us that awesome um, shot of the, the pileated woodpeckers at Sanborn. Um, those pileated woodpecker chicks fledged on June 10th, so a little time ago now, but um, hopefully they're, they're nice and strong out there. Um, so we're going to turn it over to questions. In this, yes. this photo here, um, just a pop quiz, if you can tell the difference between the hairy and the downy woodpecker. If you remember those tips that I gave, um, which one is on the left and which one is on the right. If you remember, the downy woodpecker is our, our dinky woodpecker. So that, that should help you figure that one out. Our downy is our dinky one and our uh, hairy is our, our hefty one. Okay. So, uh, Linda, if you'd like to help me with, uh, with the questions, we can go through some of those and I'll answer them the best I can. We'll probably go over a little bit, but feel free to, to tune in. Um, this was recorded, so we hope to upload the, the recording and you can, you know, listen in on the questions later. So, with that, with that uh, if Linda, if you'd like to... Um, yeah, so why don't woodpeckers always use the same hole every year? Hmm. I don't know for sure the answer to that question. I think um, part of excavating a new hole is, is part of uh, like that mating ritual and being able to create a new home and show it off to your female. 
Um, depending on the woodpecker species, some are monogamous, some aren't. So um, creating a new hole is a way to, to show that you're a fit individual um, and working together as a team to create the best habitat. Um, but I don't know for sure. I think it's just something that has evolved over time. Could have to do with, uh, you know, evading predators or something like that. Um, success of how those chicks have, have done, if they fledged or not. So I don't know for sure. There's a bunch of factors um, that could have played into it. But they do like to create new nest holes um, every season. Which then benefits the rest of the animal community out there. Yes. Yeah. So do the holes that woodpeckers make, do they damage the tree at all? So for the most part, they don't damage the tree. Um, if you have a tree that is, you know, completely covered with, with acorns, that might stress the tree out. Um, it's possible that that tree might, you know, die, at which point it can become a different type of, of habitat for other animals, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, most trees do fine with woodpecker holes. Occasionally, you know, they, that woodpecker is, you know, exposing that tree, like I kind of mentioned earlier, to, to maybe to fungus or to parasites, which, you know, can cause that tree to break down, which is a part of cycling nutrients in a forest. So uh, short answer, most trees are fine. Sometimes the tree will die, but it could have already been sick or it could just be the cycle of the forest. Okay, do, um, ugh. why would a woodpecker peck on a metal sign? So someone has a woodpecker near their house and they see it pecking on a metal sign. Why would it do that? So uh, that woodpecker is probably trying to, uh, to display to, um, and that behavior is called drumming. So woodpeckers will peck to uh, excavate and to find food, to create nest holes, or to um, kind of like that pileated woodpecker video to um, communicate something. So when you um, drum on a metal surface, it's gonna make a lot of noise. It's gonna resonate and travel far. So that is what that woodpecker is trying to do. It is trying to make a lot of noise to either you know, scare away people that are in its territory, or, you know, other birds that are in its territory, or to find a mate. So, um, you know, it, it might be annoying if you have a woodpecker that's pecking on the loudest thing possible, but that is what it's trying to do. So sometimes people like to, to cover up maybe like the, the metal flashing with like burlap or something to dampen the, the noise, but um, that woodpecker is pecking on it to advertise. So it's on purpose. Okay, do... Um, where'd that question go? Which other birds can walk up walls? So you talked mm. about the feet adaptations and the tails allowing them to walk up and up and down walls. Um, I know like nut hatches yeah, and ground creepers. Yep. Are yeah, they any? beat me to it. That's, uh, that sorry. was going to be my answer. Those are the first two that come to mind. Chickadees are also pretty, um, pretty good at kind of walking around on trees, but yeah, nut hatches and creepers are really good at walking up and down, which is a little different from woodpeckers. Most of the time woodpeckers are gonna go up a tree or across a branch, whereas um, nut hatches and creepers can go up and down. So walking up walls, but I didn't say the superpower was walking down walls. So there's a distinction there. You might have to find another way down. With all the pecking and the drumming that woodpeckers do, do they ever get a headache? Is there any way to know that? You know, scientists have definitely, I think, tried to figure out whether or not woodpeckers, you know, like get concussions or if they experience something like we do with a headache. But, um, so we don't know, I think, for sure that they don't get headaches, but they do have lots of adaptations that help to protect their brain, like the spongy uh, bony layer, the tongue that provides cushion, um, the, uh, the way their beak is designed that directs the force down, their brain is really tight in their skull so it's not sloshing around. So there's a lot of things that have helped woodpeckers to evolve so that they're not getting injured. So to say that they don't get headaches, I don't know that we can say for sure, but they're at least, they're, you know, they're well enough to survive and have chicks and offspring and reproduce over generations. So can't be too bad. 
talking about the pileated woodpeckers, you were saying that the males have the red mustache and the women, the, the females only have the black feathers, but do they both have the red caps? Yes. So in uh, pileated woodpeckers, both have the red caps. Um, the, the downy hairy and nettles, those are the ones that have um, the, what's it called, dichromatic uh, coloring. So males and females are different. Um, flickers, the male, I actually I can't remember if the, if the males and females have the same. Um, there, most woodpecker species have some version of this, this different coloring between males and females. Um, acorn woodpeckers, the males and females, both have red caps, but the red cap on the male is slightly bigger. So for the female, it almost looks like she's balding, like her red cap, her red clown wig is like a receding hairline almost. Um, so most have, uh, the only the males, it's really like half and half, honestly, now that I'm like stacking it all up. So some do, some don't, but pileated woodpeckers both have the red cap. Yes. Okay, talking about their food, how far do woodpeckers travel for their food? Hmm. Um, so to my knowledge, I think most woodpeckers establish some kind of a territory. So I'm not exactly sure how big a, an individual woodpecker's territory can be. Um, but for the most part, our woodpeckers here are not migratory. So they're living in kind of the same range throughout the year. So I don't know exactly how, how far they'll travel for food, how big that territory is, but they do tend to stick to the same area. And then that tongue that they use, does it only go out and back or can they move it in like side to side? How, how flexible and maneuverable um, is that tongue? I'm trying to, to go back on my slides a little bit. Um, do, do. can't really see it in this one. I, I thought I had a picture where you could see the tongue going to the side. For the most part, it's going to just go out and back in. It's going to follow, you know, the beak. But once it gets out of the beak, it can do a little bit of like side to side, depending on what, what prey it is that they're trying to, to go after. So um, for the most part, it's out and back in, um, but following the, the line of that beak. Okay, last question that I see, unless there's, oh, hold on, there were a few more that came in. Um, one is about the ivory-billed woodpecker mm -hmm. um, in Big Thicket, Texas. Um, ha are there been any new confirmed sightings in the last 40 years? I'm guessing this one is probably considered extinct at this point? Yeah, I think for the most part, we've kind of decided that it's extinct. And I'm not aware off the top of my head of any other sightings um, that were able to be confirmed. I think there might have been something that, that came up where someone had claimed to see one more recently, but they weren't able to actually confirm it, something about the way that they reported it. So um, I don't know the answer to that question. It'd be really cool if they were still out there. Hopefully we just can't find them. but. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, two last questions. Um, Frances had a woodpecker pecking at the siding of her house last year. What was it doing? I think we've answered that one. It could be just drumming to communicate yes. or... Yeah, so it, um, it really depends. So if it's, you know, a really fast kind of motion or sound, then that could be drumming. If it's more of a, like a peck and then a break and then a peck and a break, it could be looking for, for insects. So that's one thing, um, you know, some people might get annoyed with a woodpecker pecking at their house, but it's important to try and figure out why they're pecking because maybe you have, you know, wood boring insects or ants or something in the walls of your house and that woodpecker's just trying to get what is already causing kind of a problem for you. So identifying what type of, of pecking it is is really important. So it could have just been drumming if it was storing acorns like you'd see because you'd see the acorns or if it was trying to get after insects um i think you'd see a hole that was kind of just more open so uh just paying attention to maybe even what woodpecker it is that's doing the behavior um is important too okay last question after the young fledge how much contact do they have with the adults 
Um, so it depends on the woodpecker species. So for acorn woodpeckers, that's different because the young actually stick around and help raise their, their siblings um, for a while. I think it's up to like two years. I don't know for sure though. And then other woodpeckers, um, they, they do rely on their parents for, I'd say at least a couple of weeks, just trying to, to like, they'll beg for a parent and then the parent will come feed them. Um, I actually was really lucky and, and witnessed this recently. I traveled uh, a couple months ago to Maine and I saw some pileated woodpeckers there that had recently fledged. And I saw uh, the parent up above kind of come down the tree a little bit and feed uh, the, the young that was begging right underneath. So they had left the nest, but they were still relying on that parent for food. So um, I don't know for sure. I think it depends on the different species, how long they rely on their parents, but for sure acorn woodpeckers stay and stick around and help out. They don't leave. And I know I said that was the last question, but I did find a couple others. So I'm sorry, no I know we're over okay. a little bit, but I do want people to get their questions answered. Do both males and females feed the chicks? Yes. In the video, the male was feeding the chicks. Is that true of all the woodpecker species? Um, there might be some, some differences in different species, but to my knowledge, with most woodpecker species, it's both the male and the female that are helping to rear the offspring. Um, and yeah. then do they stay with the same mate every year? How long are they monogamous? Are they, do they stick around with that person for quite a while? Or so, not person, bird. <laughs> so again, that depends on the species. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, pileated woodpeckers are very monogamous, so they'll stay with the same um, mate, I think, until the mate passes away. Um, acorn woodpeckers are, are complicated. They'll, um, they won't allow new breeding females into their clan until all of the females have died. So that's when there's an opening. So they are just sticking together until they really need to expand. Um, it, it's different in all the different species and I don't know off the top of my head which ones are monogamous for their whole life versus a season. And then is six chicks the norm? Um, no, I don't think so. So in the book there, that flicker had six chicks. That seemed a little high to me. Um, pileated woodpeckers, um, obviously here we had two that fledged. Um, I don't know if there were more than two eggs, but um, six seems like a lot, but I don't know for sure. I think it definitely depends on the species, how many eggs they lay and, and how big a, a, a clutch is, how big, um, how many fledglings they have. Now our very, I promise, our last question, um, where do sap suckers don't go in the summer? So I'm pretty sure that they go to um, higher elevations. So they'd go more to like the Sierra, to like Yosemite and to that area or further up uh, in kind of the Pacific Northwest. Um, when I looked at the, the species map over time, that appeared to be where the, the little blobs moved. So um, they, like, they like to be in higher elevations, I think, for breeding season. Okay, we are done with our questions, so we'll just kind of wrap up. When we do send you the um, upload the link of the recording, I apologize. It's, I started it a little bit after we started, so it might start a little bit weird, but it does contain the entire story of the Woodpecker book and everything following. Yes, so look for that recording. We'll try and get that up for you. Um, soon, but uh, thanks again for joining in. I hope that you uh, learned a lot today. Um, be sure to check out our, our website, parkhere.org, for all of our upcoming uh, virtual programs. Um, we have a wide variety of programs from history to cultural to uh, natural resources, so there's lots to learn. Um, we hope that you continue to join us. Uh, stay safe out there. I hope that, um, you know, there's a lot going on in our communities right now with wildfire and the pandemic. So stay safe um, and uh, hope to see you at uh, some of our future programs. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day, everyone.